So uh, I showed some cases last week. I sent them on you guys. So um, I don't know if Travis or Howard would like to start this week. Either Any way, time. I've got plenty. All right. I'll start with you, and then Howard can go next. Then. All right. Well, this is a, an interesting case that Kim showed me. I was in Buenos Aires last week lecturing, and this she told me to look at this case. This is a patient you can see has a chronic type B dissection. And this is pre-op CT for descending thoracic aorta repair. So that nothing exciting there. This is immediately post-op. And you can see they've done a left thoracotomy approach, got a selective intubation here, and then a bunch of surgical clips. This is a few hours later. And now you see there's opacification on the left. You think maybe this patient is bleeding since it's an aortic surgery, except that there's volume loss, if anything. Certainly doesn't look like it's occupying space. And he's not, he's intubated, so it's hard to tell how he's doing. This is a, the next day. And then this is later, the ne that same next day. So this is post-op day two, and there, or this, I guess these are both the same images. There were a whole, whole host of radiographs and showing persistent opacification after aortic surgery. So this is not, anything to do with the lung, except that they went in through a left thoracotomy approach. So do you guys know where I'm going with this? Any guesses? Torsion. Uh, exactly, uh, yeah. So this is the CT and you know, th there is the left lower lobe is still there, but you can see the left upper lobe is you know, edematous, boggy, if you will. The left upper lobe artery pinches off right here. And the left superior pulmonary vein just kind of disappears, as does the airway right here as well. So I, what's ironic is on Friday, part of it was showing interesting cases. And I showed a case that I had shown you guys a few years ago from Emory of complete left lung torsion after aortic surgery, where they had mobilized the left lung and the whole thing had torsed. Well, this time they mobilized the left lung. They did ligate the pulmonary ligament, but in this case, the patient had a complete left major fissure and the left lung, you know, the left lower lobe stayed intact, but the left upper lobe had twisted 180 degrees and they went back in that night and, you know, and the lung was dead by that point in time. So this was the, the second case of, of spontaneous torsion that I, well, not spontaneous, but torsion I've seen after aortic surgery where the lung was not intervened upon other than deflated so they could get to the aorta. Hmm. Well, what's, the, what's the direction of the 180 here? So can you explain I, to me? I think that based on how things are curving, I'm, I'm guessing that it rotated, they said clockwise, and I guess that means from a left-sided approach, it means from front to back, I guess. But you know, this is this is all lung because I think they were doing that CT, wondering if there was going to be a big hemothorax or whatever. But this is all just dead infarcted lung at this point in time. Wow. Gee. I know the torsions have been have been uh, coming frequently recently. You know, this is a patient who is 28 years old and has this humongous mass in the left hemithorax. And this mass, you know, is so big that it's hard to tell where it's coming from. It looks like it's probably pleural or maybe mediastinal or, you know, coming up from the diaphragm or somewhere. But, you know, certainly large masses, you think about sarcomas, in, in, especially in young patients or some big germ cell tumor. She's only 29. Any guesses on what you think this is? Because it's actually, a, you know, something we see just not usually in patients this long. And I know that's probably a leading question. Is it a big giant thymoma? Um, no, it, and it's actually not. It's it's coming from the pleural space. It actually turns out to be a huge fibrous tumor of the pleura. Wow, it's so vascular. Wow. And what's really interesting too is I'll show you the the angiogram here. You know, it doesn't have the the typical. I don't see a vascular pedicle that we typically see with these, and it's not actually lung parenchymal supply. 
the major supply of this, this is a, a selective a, a branch of the left internal mammary artery. So subclavian the internal mammary and most of the blood supply is coming from systemic vessels. So there was also one intercostal artery, but they went in and embolized these. And, but sure enough on path that this was, you know, a 19 centimeter solitary fibrous tumor. And it wasn't a malignant one either. They using this, the scoring that they talk about mitosis, no high grade uh, cytologic atypia, stats, uh, sticks, you know, consistent with solitary fibrous tumor. So. I, th I think the thing that supports that is it's relatively homogeneous and it's also very large. So to accommodate, it, this must be a slow growing thing for the patient yeah. to accommodate it so well. Um, and so, I mean, the first thing I thought of when I saw this big blob that's pretty homogeneous is, is a solitary fibrous tumor. It's a bit, it seems to have a higher origin though, right? I mean, this. Yeah. So where, where was it? Can we tell what part of the pleura it came right. off? No, Upper they didn't, they didn't describe that. I mean, we, I think your point is valid though, because it's getting most of its supply from vessels you think of as, you know, higher up with the internal mammaries and, and such. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, no, but I, I just, I wouldn't really think about that in somebody who's in their twenties, I guess that's one of the issues I had with this case, but. Yeah, j just the appearance of it before I registered the, the, the age is what suggested it to me, big, big, big and bland. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's very uniform. And I mean, sometimes we see fibrous tumors with calcium and other heterogeneous areas, but yeah, I, I agree. I think that's probably the best thing it has going for it for that. If it's inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is something else to think of when you see a large lesion yeah. in a person. Let me see. I'm going to do this one's kind of a fun one. This is this falls into my category of better to be lucky than good cases. And this was one of the MSK fellows called me to ask about what I thought about the lungs on this spine CT and if I thought there was fibrosis. And so I'm scrolling through looking at this. And then, of course, that big thing jumped out. So I said, well, I don't really know if this is just a little bit of atelectasis or scar. It doesn't really look like anything else. But what about that huge tumor that happens to be in the right main stem bronchus? And of course, they had not recognized that. So this guy was asymptomatic from that standpoint. I don't know what his spine issue was, but he had had an MRI of his thoracic spine a year before, and you can see it, I think, right here on the top image as well. So it's been there a while. It's uniform. Here it is more clearly on this T2-weighted sequence. So you know, it certainly doesn't look that sinister. They did a, a follow-up non-contrast CT for this, and you can see that this is actually, oh, th you know, this one, yeah, right there. So that's it right there. And you know, it looks like it's pedunculated. The interventional bronchoscopist went in, took it out. It was a typical, car a typical carcinoid tumor. And you can see here. So it's just a, a, a good look for that and a good location in the main stem bronchus. And just a kind of a fun one since it was totally incidental, an accidental discovery on the uh, spine CT. So a atypical presentation of typical carcinoid. Yeah, exactly. A Yeah, atypical one word presentation of a space typical carcinoid. Yes, exactly. And then this is another, just a quick one. We don't often show mammograms in this conference, but I'm going to, because this is a patient who came into the ED the other day, chest pain. She's in her thirties and the, you know, I think what was correctly described was this lesion right here. And it looks like it may be calcified. It's kind of little ovoid shaped. She also had a prior radiograph from a couple years ago. And I think this is kind of where it's interesting because you don't see anything here at that point in time. So it's new. I will also direct you, let's see, there's nothing on that old one. It's also satisfaction of search, I think, because there's another similar looking thing on the other side that wasn't commented on. So you can see they're all, it's also calcified. And so they did a CT because of this. I think comparing to the mammogram might have been helpful, but when you look at the mammogram, you will see on the, let's, let's get the uh, 
left side, that these are huge calcified areas of fat necrosis. That's the one on the right that I think we're seeing. And this is the one on the left. And they had done a diagnostic ultrasound in the past at the time of this. And I don't know what her, if she had trauma at that point in time, or if it was just a palpable abnormality. But that is what you're going to see on the CT when I show you here in a moment is areas of fat necrosis and not a lung mass. And so you can see that's yeah. the one that we saw on the radiograph on the left. There's the smaller ones on the right. And you can see typical rim calcification, areas of macroscopic fat attenuation within. So yeah. bilateral breast fat necrosis showing up on chest radiographs. Well, very nice. Okay. I will stop there and uh, Jeff, we can come back. And right. I, I do want to comment, there was no lateral done on either of those. We don't generally do laterals on on younger patients in the ED. I don't know, really? do you guys still commonly do them? I wish we did more. We do. I, I mean, it's it's so many times it's so helpful just to, you know, either to confirm something or more often, yeah. more often to refute that something's there. Yeah. Right. I think one of the arguments is reducing radiation in these patients, but then you have something like this that could have arguably been saved, you know, instead of one lateral, they got, you know, a CT instead, but granted that doesn't work across the whole population, but in one specific patient it does. So we can, I'll come back and show some more at the end okay. if you want. Howard, do you want to go? Yep. All right. Okay, I'll start with this one. Um, the findings here are really subtle, but they're, they're a nice teaching findings. So we have a frontal and lateral projection of the chest on a, a young person. And let me bring up the frontal projection, give you a moment to look at that. And if you wanted a case to talk about the notion of evaluating a bronchoarterial bundle, where if you see the artery and the bronchus on end, and you compare the size of the artery with its companion bronchus, typically we teach, of course, that they're typically the same size. And if we really are seeing this on end and this on end, and we seem to be, then this seems to be bigger than that. And if that is the case, then, and you happen to see that, then you have to ask yourself, is that just a fake out or are these vessels really a little bit too big? And then typically I teach that when you look at a frontal projection of the chest with the patient upright, when you're talking about distribution of pulmonary blood flow, particularly if you're lucky enough to see these vessels down here, um, you have normal where these vessels down here are slightly bigger. And we have inversion of pulmonary blood flow, but that involves both arteries and veins. So the vessels are more distended in the upper lung zones and the lower lung zones. And then we have a distribution of pulmonary blood flow where you discern that the vessels are distended, but equally distended in the upper and lower lung zones. And then it's a bit hard to know whether you have both arteries and veins, but that would be a so-called balanced distribution of pulmonary blood flow. And then if you don't have, for example, a distended SVC and azicus vein to suggest that you're looking at a consequence of hypervolemia, then one should think of left to right shunts. So you have increased pulmonary blood flow. And then the question is, is it a real finding? Of course, if it's subtle, you may not be sure, but you might question that and ask the question, does the person have findings of pulmonary hypertension and anything else to suggest that we do in fact have a shunt, a left to right shunt. So this is a person that does have a shunt and then we typically teach that if you have a shunt, the most common is atrial septal defect compared to if it's intrathoracic, other things like a PDA or a VSD. And of course, of the ASDs, the most common is the secundum, but um, less common, you start to look. And I always teach my residents, if you're not sure, look very carefully at the pulmonary veins and make sure that all the pulmonary veins go to the right place and that is the case here, except for on the right side. So if you look carefully at the pulmonary veins, you'll see that some of them go to the SVC rather than to the atrium. And you keep on looking to see whether you do in fact have PAPVR, 
with those veins going to the wrong place. And if you see that, then of course one should look very carefully for a superior sinus venosis type of ASD, which is right here. So a really nice example of all of those findings with a superior sinus venosis defect, which is that, that defect is right here. Very nice example of that. So the uh, classic treatment for this is the so-called warden procedure. So I'll try and make that big. So this person is scheduled for a warden procedure to correct that. So you see how they basically isolate that segment where the anomalous pulmonary veins go in and using some pericardium, they create a baffle so that it goes to the left atrium. And then basically you connect up the SVC with the right atrium again. And then you can see here the excerpts of the op report here where it's a nice description of the warden procedure. So I'll just leave that up for a few seconds so that you can read that. Or if you're viewing the video, just pause that and you can see a description of the warden procedure to fix that right there. Okay. So that's a nice kind of subtle case, but a, a nice one. This is um, something we always kind of talk about. So we have someone that has surgery and I don't know about the policy in your hospital, but often hospitals have a policy of getting intraoperative radiography if the operation lasts longer than a certain period of time. Or of course, if needle counts are off or sponge counts are off, we have intraoperative radiography like this this being in the context of uh, thoracic surgery and aortic surgery. And here's a nice example of a Raytec sponge. So it has a very typical appearance, a kind of wavy, somewhat corrugated appearance of something that should not be there. And it has that appearance because this is the radio opaque portion of a Raytec sponge. Or if it isn't actually a Raytec, it's just uh, another one that has the same construction basically. And that is indeed a Raytec sponge. So they took him back to surgery while well, he was still there. They just opened up, took that away. And that was the end of that. But just a nice example of a retained Raytec sponge or Raytec like look sponge right there. Uh, Howard, okay. I think uh, one point about those is um, I've seen a case years and years ago where it mimicked a sternal wire because ah. it was, you know, it's it's kind of twist tied. It was and it was yeah. in the midline with the wires. So, right in the I yeah. not see it. So you got to always yeah, sort of, and there's all these sometimes these external wires from the various pacing devices and stuff. So you got to always have a high index of suspicion. It's such a rare occurrence yeah. these days. Yeah. But. yeah. In this count, they their sponge counts were off, so they were really suspicious of needing one in, and we just confirmed that just at a glance. Yeah, yeah that's interesting that, since. I mean, our surgeons don't close up if the sponge counts off. Yeah, maybe they, maybe I didn't get the full history, but this is intra-op and it's curious. Maybe they just, yeah, I don't know. But, but again, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's because it, the sponge counts off, but there's never actually anything left behind or they just close up anyway, but. Maybe they're skeptical that the, the sponge count is actually off and they say, oh, let's close up, get a rip. So I don't really you know. <laughs> when I was, there was a case when I was a resident that there were five, I don't remember if it was four or five or six sponges, but they come in packs of that number. So they actually had left an entire pack of sponges in the abdomen, but they didn't realize that the sponge count was off because they only did it by like multiples of that number. Oh. So, okay. yeah. Now this one is um, just a, a nice example of, you'll see. So we're reading out with um, a trainee and the person correctly observed these opacities, small, anterior chest, near pleural surface, and wondered what those were and wondered if there was just some kind of just small foci of parenchymal scarring in the anterior portion of the lungs, but that's obviously rather unusual. 
And of course, the tip off is typically if you see something super symmetric like that, you really wonder about anatomy, some feature of anatomy that really is simulating an abnormality. So I'll just switch that over like that and I will mag it up. And actually, if you scroll through it, you see the symmetry, of course, it's quite small. But you can see there's a bit of fat adjacent to it and it actually appears to be plural, particularly extra plural with lovely asymmetry. So here is a just a depiction of the fact that you can see in the anterior chest, here you can see the symmetry of the two opacities, lovely symmetry to it in the anterior chest. So this is a really nice example of the transverse thoracic muscle. So just to quickly uh, review the anatomy of the chest, uh, going from the inside out, we have here visceral parietal pleura, extrapleural fat, endothoracic fascia. Then we have an innermost intercostal muscle. Then we have some fat containing intercostal fat and, and vessels. Then we have the internal and external intercostal muscles. So with respect to the innermost intercostal muscles, that portion of it in the anterior chest is called the transverse thoracic muscle when you see it like that. And sometimes you see the innermost intercostal muscles produce pseudopleural disease down here, in which case that muscle is called subcostal muscle, but also part of the innermost intercostal muscle. So that's what it is. And here's a nice article if you want to read up more about it. Just found one that was very nice. Things that mimic, for example, pleural abnormality is the article. And they have some nice pictures of that here particularly of the transversus thoracis muscle right there. So I don't know why we see it sometimes and why it looks so modular in this patient. I think it's just random. That's like that. So Howard, the, uh, the picture on the left here, I've seen, I've seen that quite a number of times in it. And it's always when I'm looking for plaque. Uh, so if it's nice and symmetrical up there, you know, I, I will blow that off and it doesn't really protrude into lung. But yeah. I've never seen like what you showed to begin this yeah. case, where yeah. it really seems to be set on a little pedicle almost. Yeah. yeah kind of curious. Like that. Yeah. This is amazing. Not wrong, but I, I'm pretty confident that's what we're looking at. It's not something else weird. For that. No, you're probably right. It's probably just a hypertrophied one, like you've said. For no particular reason, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I think. And then I think this this show depicts kind of the anatomy nicely. You see it's got some length to it, as it were. Unless I'm faking myself out by some other means. Okay. So I think that's what it is. Um, all right, here is an interesting case. I'll withhold the history for a moment, but this patient was transferred to our hospital from another institution where he presented with a certain set of symptoms. And as best I can tell, they identified perhaps by ultrasound that he has pericardial fluid. So he does have an enlarged cardiac opacity, which turned out to be pericardial fluid. And now, if you look at that and look at the pacemaker device, let's take a look at that for a moment. So assume that we're looking at pericardial fluid and more than just a little, and that we can ascribe or wonder whether the distended azicus vein, maybe the distended SVC or at least the distended azicus vein is because he has pericardial fluid and a component perhaps of pericardial tamponade. And then Typically with the atrial appendage lead, and it comes down and typically kind of sweeps towards you with the tip being about here somewhere, but this tip is too high. That sweep is a bit unusual because usually the tip doesn't project that high, but rather comes down and sweeps here. Kind of. So this is interesting. And sure enough, we easily confirm that that tip is in the outside of the pericardium 
that side of the heart. And here you can see it. So in on contrast, you can see there is hemopericardium, but pretty easy to see that the tip of the atria lead has perforated through and is located in the pericardial space and has gone too, through and too high. So they put a drain in, initially drained some pericardial blood, and then the next day after things were stable, they replaced that lead. I think it's the first atrial lead perforation that I have seen, I think, whereas we've all seen a fair number of right ventricular leads perforate on occasion. Yeah, and unless right. it's projecting lateral, you know, outside the heart, then it's, I mean, it's hard to, I, I would just ignore that position of that left, or that left, or right atrial lead every time. Don't you think this one is a little bit unusually high, the tip of it? It usually comes I mean, from atrial appendage and kind of sweeps, makes the curve where the tip projects about I guess I, I've never really thought about the height of it in, yeah. in that if they have atrial fibrillation and have a big appendage. Yeah, could be. But in my experience, they, they typically don't project that high, the tip that is, because the curve is from, is curve is anterior towards one, then it attaches to the anterior atrial appendage. And the tip, I think that's a bit high. Yeah, I don't know. I've, certainly I've, in the context I've, of I've never really thought about yeah. it that much. Yeah. In terms of the height yeah. of that atrial lead, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, Howard, where is it in terms of anterior and posterior? Can we can we can we check the uh, the sag and so there it goes, and then there it goes. It's rather high. It okay. usually does something like this, right? Yeah, and the tip being that high is a bit unusual if you think about it. So I would say my my experience, if I had to image them. The curve in the atrial appendage would be something like that. Yeah, -ish, agreed. Rather yeah. than that up there. Right. Yeah, so you can see where it is in relation to the atrium and how high it's gone anteriorly. And the sweep of it, I could do, I could do this just for fun. Uh, let's make it a nice thick sweep like that, let's see. And then I'll do something like that. Something like that. <clears throat> okay, Jeff. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Howard. David, do you have any cases? Not this week, sorry. That's all right. Okay, so this is an uh, interesting case I came across. This is a 52-year-old male. Oh, hold on, you don't see it yet. Oh, there we go. Um, who is being evaluated for a kidney transplant, uh, has autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, and does not have very normal-looking lungs. He's got these cyst cystic spaces that seem to uh, cluster together and have a basal predominance. Um, and I vaguely remembered some association between uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and lung cysts. And, and bronchiectasis has been reported as well. It's a very rare association. Um, so I did a little reading about it. And apparently the PDK gene, PDK1 gene, I think, um, which, which is one of the mutations in this condition, is very close to the TSC gene complex, the TSC2 gene, which we see with LAM. And, you know, of course, both can cause um, cysts in the lung and uh, cyst-like lesions in the kidneys. Of course, though, this is would be just blands and hemorrhagic cysts as opposed to angiomyolipomas. Um, so I pulled this, uh, I'll show you here, this case report. There's really not a lot published on it, but uh, it, it's a nice uh, discussion of it, but I'll show you. Uh, this patient just had this kind of one big cyst and had more bronchiectasis in their case, um, but um, I, it has been a, a description. There's some, yeah, there's some, you can see, it more looks like just, I wondered if this cyst was maybe related to an old infection, hard to say, but I think they did a workup, but 
typical abdomen appearance. But there are some references in here regarding um, regarding this. But I'll show you the. Uh, let's see. Um, and then you can see the kidneys down here. Oops, just get, get the top of them, but very typical appearance. And then on the coronals, you can see these cysts. You know, sort of sort of look Bert Hogg Dubay like. Um, they're sort of irregular shaped with that basal yeah. dominant, but. Yeah, this is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. All right, um, this is a case uh, my colleague Chris Francois shared with me. This is a, a trauma case. Um, it's a middle-aged guy who was um, uh, working on a tree, cutting um, a tree with a big saw, and um, the tree branched it. He didn't fall, but the saw crashed into his chest. And the radiograph, uh, this was a radiograph, is, it shows a little bit of, um, not hard to see much, there's a little bit of an apical cap up here. Um, and maybe on close inspection, you may see a little defect in the rib, but that's, that's a tough spot because there's often a gap there. You see he's got a clavicle fracture as well, um, but this little apical cap. And one wonders if the trachea is slightly displaced. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Yes, correct. Good observation, Howard. I, I, I failed to mention that. Yes, so of course, with a uh, direct injury with a saw, you'd have to worry about blood, and um, and this is—it's kind of a cool injury. Uh, it's not one I recall seeing in this location, and you'll see there's there's some swelling up in that area. But look at the left subclavian artery, filling defect in it, and then there's a looks like a mural abnormality going down to the arch. And there's gas and you can see there's the fracture but the fracture is through the rib cartilage that had subsequently ossified so um and then there's a lung hernia associated with it as well but sort of an isolated subclavian artery so there you see intramural hematoma um and i don't know why um we saw the displacement of the trachea because you don't yeah really, it's not really displaced it's just you don't think see it's hematoma it's a fake out. yeah it's and an observation same, but and same with really and same with the apical cap there's really no hematoma yeah. here no it's just a fake out yeah it's but yeah anything. so it was so a the, saw blade injury through there plus just the blunt force of it but i don't know how it got the subclavian artery and nothing keep looking at that left sternoclavicular joint and wondering if the if the clavicle perhaps yeah. subluxed yeah you wonder it is a little wide there but and you so, see maybe so some capsular is, disruption right here yeah, that's a. I'm wondering if it just uh, subluxed or transiently dislocated. And I wonder if that's unstable. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, kind of, wow. Yeah, but I, I've seen subclavian artery injuries, but I've always seen them right in here with a first rib injury. You know, we've seen occlusions. I can't remember if I've shown one in this conference. I've seen vein injuries there, and I've seen axillary artery injuries, but I've never seen one this proximal. But Kind of a neat case. Here's the coronal. Jeff, was the uh, did the saw blade cut into this guy, or did it just? It did. Get it did. I'll show you where. Um, I'll switch it to the lung window so you can see. Um, you can see right there. There's a lung hernia. It kind of buzzed right through. It's unclear. I, I don't see a cutaneous defect, but there's right. gas here. So I don't know if it if the impact of it fractured it and actually didn't cut him, because um, you don't see a big defect in the chest wall. I was just briefly looking over the note, um, and it just described the saw. So it kind of looks more like a blunt fracture, doesn't it? Yeah. Because the skin is intact. Yeah. Yeah. So I like Travis's theory that the the sternoclavicular joint, I mean, this right in here. It's got a big hematoma in it. Yeah, and just it hit that's that. Left. Wow. Yeah. So that's kind of... So if that is the case, it's kind of that, you know, the theory about the osseous pinch theory of aortic mural injury in general. Uh-huh. It could be like a variant of that theme. Maybe. We have it displaced. Yeah, yeah you can see it right there. The yeah, I'm the melody. Squash the, the, the artery. Wow. All right. Maybe. This is the uh, the Klingon nerve pinch variant of that. Jeez. All right. So this patient, let me get that. Let's see. So this patient, um, presented with a chest wall mass that was palpable and so had a CT. It had been seen past, and I'll, I'll show the older imaging, but 
it's just a, a really nice example right of right here you see at this rib cartilage there's this there's this expansile mass and it has this this matrix right at the rib end, so at the cartilaginous cap so this is a great look for a chondrosarcoma um, and you know two-thirds of them occur in the anterior chest wall and it is the most primary and most common primary malignant neoplasm of the chest wall and its patients a good age for it. I think it was, fit, uh, was it 50 or 60 I uh, can't remember um, yeah, I'll go back it was uh, 65 65 year old but in you know in retrospect I found some old outside imaging uh, and you can see on this rib series and this was uh, about a year before there's this little sclerotic thing at that rib um, on the oblique it doesn't it's right there and the lateral I don't think added very much uh, but I did find an old CT from the outside and it's about two years before this so this must be a very low grade one because um, in retrospect and I don't think anyone would prospectively call this there's a, it's a little it's still it almost looks like an old fracture there because it doesn't have much mass effect there but it does have some matrix there so it almost looks like it maybe it was fractured at some point we do see fractures in that location so just sort of a slowly growing chondrosarcoma with a nice matrix. All right, and then last case, nothing terribly exciting, uh, but this was a patient, a uh, 40-year-old female, came in uh, short of breath, uh, carries a diagnosis of lupus, and you look at her chest radiograph, and she's got a little curve to her spine. You might argue it looks a little hazy. There's some maybe some ill-defined opacity in that left lung, you know, the lateral, not terribly exciting. So she got a CT scan, um, and she does have some sort of nodular areas of consolidation. And as we go down, you'll see it's a little bit more confluent uh, down the lower lobes, some ground glass opacity, just kind of patchy, some of it nodular, and then it becomes more confluent there. So in the setting of lupus, you'd have to think about infection because of uh, complement, low levels of complement. Uh, you can think of lupus pneumonitis, which is sort of acute lung injury from immune complexes, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, um, a drug toxicity if she was on anything. Um, and those would be the major considerations. Uh, she didn't have hemoptysis, but she was just had a slightly low uh, oxygen saturation. So she got a bronchoscopy, and it did show uh, diffuse uh, findings of, of pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, they got uh, macro... Um, hemocytin-related macrophages, but also some fresh blood in there. So uh, this is thought to be a secondary vasculitis from lupus um, immune complex deposition. And uh, this is a mild case, but it can be life-threatening and patients can be quite hypoxic. And uh, it's confirmed by bronchoscopy. This, this particular finding uh, case is a little bit more nodular. I probably would have favored infection more just because a lot of them look like central lobular nodules. But with that amount of hypoxia, it always makes me think about, or even a little bit, I think about some bleeding. She didn't have any pleural or pericardial involvement, but has uh, skin involvement um, and has had some sort of long-term disease. So a case of lupus-associated diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Okay, that's all I have this week. Um, Travis, you said you had some more? Sure. All right, I'll turn it over to you. This one's, let's see. This one's not as subtle as the one that Howard showed by any stretch. Hey Travis, look at the position of that atrial thing. You see? Yeah, it's it's. Right. I agree. It's much lower. That's what I mean, it is. Yeah. Usually. Yeah, you're right, and that's exactly how you say the the atrial one should uh, should point to. You know, if you have a lateral. Yeah, about uh, that. This one's not subtle though. This is a patient. This was only placed a month ago at another hospital in the South Bay area and came in with frequent alarm firings. There was no triggering of the diaphragm or anything, but you can clearly see that this one is outside the confines of the, the heart. The heart looks normal size. There was actually, there was no significant effusion on here. This was just a, a straight clean perforation of the right ventricle all the way here. So they took this out, watched him for a, a day, put in another one, and he was good to go. So it, it had perfed, but it didn't, cause any sort of blood or anything yeah interesting yeah but no i was i was looking at that one howard as you were talking yeah. and, and saying yeah. yeah just how much 
because yours was up closer to the carina. Again, it's yeah. something I've never really thought about before, but I'll pay more attention to that with the atrial leads. So, you know, the more traditional ventricular perforation that we see. This is an, a radiograph from a couple of days ago, and I think that it's a good example because it's an unusual you know, presentation of something that we see not infrequently. And this patient, you know, is large to start with, so I think it limits things a little bit. They have a port catheter. They have known melanoma. And you can see there's a bunch of opacity in the left hemithorax. This is the, the second view they took at that same time. And there's this left hemithorax, you can see there's, you can hallucinate maybe that the diaphragm is elevated here. One gets the sense there may be some volume loss. But as you can see right here that, you know, despite him being so large, it looks like you've got the suggestion of a lift sickle. This is the one I saw yesterday. And sure enough, this yeah. looks like a lipsicle. The He had a pleural effusion on the prior one, which was tapped, which is why I think there was so much more opacity there, which complicated things. But it's a kind of a sneaky one, but it definitely is a left upper lobe collapse. And this was from a couple of days before. So it was known, and this is from melanoma. There's a big hyalur metastasis here obstructing it. He also... You probably noticed as I was scrolling through, it had pulmonary emboli. So there's not a lot of volume loss in this left upper lobe from this obstruction, but uh, it's you can see the correlate on the CT for the lipsicle, this the superior segment of the left lower lobe extending up, kind of wrapping around the little beak there around that left upper lobe that's collapsed. So the you know on this one it's pretty textbook. On this one, it's a little bit harder just because of the effusion that was there at that time. Yeah. And also a, li a little bit of rotation and under penetration yeah. from his body habitus. So the latter, yeah. the latter would be interesting in that case too, because you should see a retrosternal stripe and it's probably a fairly fat one in him. That, yeah, that's right, right there. Fat. Yeah. Yeah. They did the lateral looking to see how much pleural fluid was left yesterday. Yeah. And you know, when I first looked at the lateral, you know, it's, it's like you said, David, it's so fat, you know, almost was wondering if it was going to be his arm. Clearly his arms are both up you know, and you don't see humerus right in here, but yeah, it's such a pronounced, you know, uh, anterior or, you know, the opacity from the left upper lobe collapsed anteriorly. So this is yeah. really a drowned, a drowned upper lobe with very, with little volume loss. So yeah, yeah. probably just all full of secretions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Davis, mass you, is... So yes, put, up, um, front, put up the one frontal projection again. I'll tell you which one I... This one? Yeah, make that make that bigger and just bring it up by itself. Okay, so there's another clue here. If you're thinking volume loss and you window it just right, you can see that the left main bronchus is elevated quite a bit. Uh, right. Instead of having the usual... It's, it's elevated and that left pulmonary artery, what we see of it, the hilum is up as well. So there's some really subtle additional indirect yeah. findings of volume loss. But the one I think I noticed, because I think I see air in distal left main bronchus, that it's fairly horizontal in its orientation. Right here. Yeah, it's just uh, pulled up. So the couple of subtle additional yeah. findings of an up, that go along with an obstructive low bar. Atlectus's case. Okay. Yeah, nice case, yeah. This is one that, you know, it's, I think sometimes we get lost in some of the more rare and obscure things, but, you know, this is not a patient with lupus. I don't remember what their history was, but I think it's, it's a, one of the better textbook examples that I've seen recently of a viral bronchiolitis, and it has many of the different manifestations that we often see. And the, of course, Tomas Franquette had that nice review article in radiology back in whatever, 2010 or 2011, just talking about all the different findings that you can see. And I think this one has most of them. You have some areas where you have more discrete central lobular nodules, maybe some that are almost tree and bud, a little bit more solid, but certainly a lot of them are of ground glass attenuation. Then you have more confluent central lobular 
nodular areas of consolidation still largely affecting the centers of the secondary pulmonary lobules. You can imagine where the you know, where the interlobular septae might be, mm -hmm. certainly sparing the pleural surface. One of the findings that we often see that I think is you know that that we don't recognize or don't appreciate with this is just the presence of smooth septal thickening that you can certainly see with bronchial with a, a viral bronchiolitis plus the diffuse bronchial wall thickening. So this was an influenza B uh, positive case, and this is from a couple months ago, but I just now had it in here, and I just think it's nice to show. And also, you know, especially now that we talk so much about exposures and inhalation, and it's still a multifocal, but but geographically you know, asymmetric and, and patchy distribution, you've certainly got areas that are more normal, areas that are more severely affected. You know, I guess with I, this one, you might think aspiration as well. I don't think the septal thickening goes that well for that, and but certainly it's dependent. But so. uh, but you, if you you know we've had some cases of um, viral infections that have serial CTs on them, and they usually start out most pronounced in the upper lungs, but with time you get more and more basal consolidation, and. Um, and as in as in your case here, there most of the the most pronounced consolidation in your case here is left lower lobe. Yeah. But I do think I do think that's what's what's happening is that there is an aspiration component that is filling the lower lobes, and it often goes selectively to the left, and that is from se secretions in the upper airways draining down and and pooling down there. So I think that you're 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 sort of bringing the infection down into an aspiration zone from within the airways. And the other the other the thing that contributes to left lower lobe aspiration is sinusitis. For some reason, that often ends up, you know, draining into the left lower lobe, and so you get an aspiration component. So, um, in the publications about the findings of um, swine flu in the old days, they emphasized the lower lobe distribution in ICU patients. But if, if you catch those people earlier, it's really an upper lung start to the disease. And with time, the lower lobes fill in. And I think a lot of that is secondary to secretions rolling down there or to bacterial superinfection. Yeah, this yeah. that's interesting. And do you think it's not only that it's upper lobes, but it's also more larger airways that prohibits clearance of secretions and pre, you know, predisposes you to just accumulating stuff in the lower lobes? I think so. I mean, those yeah. bronchi are very thick and swollen yeah. and they look very unhappy. This and this just shows kind of how it evolved. This is four days later on an abdomen and pelvis CT, so it doesn't go up any further. It just shows how these become more coalescent into these lobular areas of consolidation. Right. Yeah. So just a pretty case of a, a central lobular nodules and a bronchiolitis from infection. Yeah. Yeah, All right, I think let's see. Along, okay. along David's line, um, one of the things with influenza too, I'm and I'm sorry if I missed when you were talking about it, but um, you know how the patients with influenza are prone to bacterial infection because of the mucosal injury. I wonder if the cilia don't work as well either. So that pooling right. of secretions, not only is it from yeah. aspiration, but just the lack of clearance. Got it. Right. The bronchial wall thickening, the inflammation just prohibits the natural clearance mechanisms. That's what you wonder because, you know, you see that in yeah. patients with mucositis too. Right. Yeah, I think it's a mechanical thing. Well, yeah, this is an interesting one, 48-year-old woman, and this is a radiograph from a few months ago. Let's see, I've got, I think these are all from around the same time, yeah. So you can see she's got reduced lung volumes, probably a, certainly a component of volume loss and fibrosis and a lower lung predominant process, little asymmetric right greater than left. And check out this case. So this is actually last year, I think the... Let's see, so this was, these are two months apart, but similar patterns. And in the lower lobes, it's a, it's a fairly uniform process. It's diffuse in the axial plane, both peribronchovascular and peripheral. You know, almost a little bit of some, almost some subpolar sparing in areas, but just ground glass and traction are the main findings. And some of these little, you know, these bands of consolidation we see on occasion more with NSIP. So I was thinking connective tissue disease in this patient. Do you guys agree with that, especially yeah. in a woman in her 40s? Sure. Yeah. 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 So, and then this was a few months later, a couple months later, and it's the ground glass is maybe cleared a little bit, and you've got a little bit more traction. 
She had a surgical lung biopsy. It was then sent from where she was to the Mayo in Scottsdale, and they reviewed it. And you know, she it is complicated because she does have an ANA positive, and nucleolar, of course, at any positivity can put somebody into an IPATH category. Uh, they actually favored it to be a desquamative interstitial pneumonia <clears throat> more than NSIP. And you'll see the discussion in here uh, that, and there was a, a lot of respiratory bronchiolitis. And you can see that it's extensive respiratory bronchiolitis evolved the frank DIP. And then there's some emphysema, which I you know, don't really see on here. So the interesting thing with her is that she hasn't smoked in decades, but she does vape and has vaped for several years. And so I was talking to the pulmonologist. She actually dabs as well. So she's using a butane to, to heat it up you know, even more. So different than, than, than uh, vaping, but you know, she has no history of connective tissue disease. She technically meets an IPAF diagnosis, but a few months ago, she stopped vaping. The pulmon my pulmonologist here has followed up with her. She symptomatically is feeling better. We don't have a CT on her yet, uh, but I throw this one out there as a potential, you know, another potential subacute to chronic manifestation of vaping-associated lung disease, mm. especially since histopathologically they thought it was more of a RB and DIP pattern rather than NS, you know, connective tissue disease type of NSIP. Wow. So I don't know. And the, the, all of a sudden now these acute cases are becoming less interesting in the sense that you know, they all have diffuse lung disease of many different patterns and they're becoming a dime a dozen now that people recognize them. But I think this is where there's, gonna, there's room for research trying to figure out what the hell it's gonna do in the chronic setting. So, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting and it's going to take, unfortunately, we're not going to know for a few decades. Yeah. But <clears throat> Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, have you guys seen DIP that looks like this? Because I, I still think this looks more CTD, NSIP like, especially with these large bands, probably a little bit of organizing pneumonia here in these. Er, yeah, usually it's, normal it doesn't lung. have abrupt margin. I mean, the only thing your case, it doesn't have striking traction bronchiectasis, but I think some of the older literature talks about um, some fine reticulation with DIP, but I suspect that was some yeah. mixed fibrosis. So depending on what they biopsy, if they biopsy just the periphery of the lung, they may have missed the NSIP portion of it because, of course, there's sometimes subpleural sparing. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to know what kind of biopsies, especially in, in more community centers, sometimes they... Exactly. By a thoracic surgeon, they take tiny little nibbles and maybe only do one lobe. Right, instead of three big chunks like our surgeons do, and probably <laughs> yeah. yours do too. Yeah, go back to me. <laughs> right. So, yeah, the we're getting the path set here for our pathologist to look at it, and then also she's had a more recent CT. We'll we're trying to get sent here as well, but I suspect I it's probably a mixed injury. But um, yeah, it, I'm very curious what the vaping is going to be because I think yeah, you can introduce a. Well, and then the other question too is, is, does she have, you know, does she have the risk factors for connective tissue disease and the inhalation is exacerbating things and, right. and you know. Yeah, especially you know. with those, those things. But I saw also the marijuana. I mean, who knows what's going to lead that because yeah. no filters and all sorts of things. So we'll, we'll find out. Jeff, can yep. you, I want to show you guys something in relation to the, um, the DIP kind of diagnosis that may be pertinent here. So, of course, we all typically associate DIP with smokers' macrophages. So, here's a nice article that kind of a review of that entity of DIP, but really looking for causes other than smoking. So, what's interesting about this article when they talk about DIP, and this is a review, is images like that. But what I want to show you is that. They talk about non-smoking related DIP. So look at this table, for example. So all causes other than tobacco smoking, and they've got references for different things. But isn't that interesting? And here's one of marijuana down here. So it could be DIP if that's what the pathologist thought, but maybe due to something other than smoking. So 
Yeah, you you wonder if the, the pigment in the macrophages is different because I mean, you, pathologists will talk about smokers' macrophages as a very distinct entity. But you know, one of the other things, the diesel fumes is one I've seen quite a few times, and all of these things that are listed here look like they would have particulates. And I yeah. wonder if there are subtle differences. Um, you'd have yeah. to ask a lung pathologist who knows a lot about this if the if these pigmented macrophages are slightly different. But, but the manifestation yeah. is the same in that there's sort of just uh, swaths of them filling lung and then there's thickening of the uh, alveolar walls that adjacent as in like the, the third image on the right on the top row there has got a really nice example of some wall thickening. Uh, yeah, that uh, right there. Yeah. yeah, the one on the top right, uh, really nice look for it. Yeah. So that's really interesting in your case, Travis. That's really interesting, I think. All right. It's a DNA but not smoking related. But that's, this is actually quite a nice article because we had a case like this the other day and someone, one of my pathologists sent me this article. Can you send that along, Howard? Yeah, it's right. interesting. I didn't thank know you. about that. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. We'll, we'll chat next week. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay. everyone.